Hey guys, it's Jenny and welcome back to Solid Gold. Today I want to give you an update on my goldfish. Basically, it's bad again, or I guess I should say still, because I'm having the same issues that I thought I got rid of those couple of months ago. If you're not familiar with the situation with my goldfish, you can check my previous videos so you can get all up to speed on the whole situation. But uh, basically my goldfish got sick with something pretty catastrophic to the point where I had to consolidate everyone down to the same tank and treat very heavily. And I thought that I had gotten the problem eradicated. One of the main symptoms I was seeing though was dropsy. And dropsy is very, very tricky because it's a symptom. It's not a disease in itself. It's a symptom and it can be a symptom of any number of different diseases which can be viral in nature, they can be parasitic, or they can be bacterial. So it's so hard to be able to narrow down exactly what it is you're seeing. I thought I had narrowed it down and I treated with an antibiotic and an antiparasitic medication and everything seemed to be looking a lot better. I got to the point where I thought everything was much better and the goldfish were once again stable and gonna be okay. Everything was fine or seemed fine anyways for several weeks and then I started noticing dropsy again and it wasn't just like one fish, it was two fish at the same time that were perfectly fine the day before, but the very next day they had pretty obvious signs of dropsy. Pretty, I don't want to say severe, because it's not as bad as some I've seen, but pretty advanced to the point where it was obviously something wrong. And two fish overnight. Then the next day, another fish, so the third fish all showing signs of dropsy in a very short succession. These fish were some of my favorites. Unfortunately, uh, my favorite fish have been affected the most with this problem. That seems to be the way it always goes. Don't pick a favorite fish ever because it'll be the first one to get sick and die. That's what they say. And a lot of times it feels like it's true. The three that I noticed in this recent bout, after I thought everything was fine, were three of my favorites and some of the fish that I've had for the longest too. There was Mordecai, he was a big, huge, beautiful uh, black and red butterfly telescope. Lana, my female black butterfly telescope who I'd had for quite a few years as well. Um, she was already a little bit weak. She was one of the weaker fish that I had, so I wasn't too surprised that it was her that was affected, but it still didn't make it any better. Uh, and then thirdly, my most favorite fish of the ones that I had remaining, which was Queenie. She was a female butterfly telescope goldfish that I had bred myself and I had been really, really fond of that fish and particularly attached to her. After that, I was watching very, very closely because obviously I realized that the issues weren't completely gone. And about a week later, one of my broadtail moors started showing signs of dropsy as well. This was completely beyond my ability to diagnose or anyone else's ability to diagnose without being able to inspect these fish very closely and in depth. So what I decided to do, which in hindsight, which of course they say hindsight is 2020, I wish I had done to begin with, but what I finally decided I needed to do was reach out to a university and get some tests done. So I reached out to the University of Florida's Fish Disease Diagnostics Lab. The reason I had held off for so long on going this route is that while it's gonna provide me with hopefully a definitive diagnosis to be able to start treating this properly, they also are gonna require a good amount of sacrificial fish that I can send them for them to necropsy. So they're gonna to have to euthanize the fish, cut them open, examine the tissues under a microscope, do histology, which is like taking smears of the, of the tissues and sending them out for processing and then getting them back and looking at them under the microscope. Very involved, very detailed stuff that you can only do if you are able to sacrifice that fish to be able to do that in-depth testing. Otherwise, they're so limited on what they can do and they really couldn't give me an answer. So, in addition to Lana, Mordecai, and Queenie that had already died after I thought everything was fine, I had to select an additional three fish that I was going to sacrifice and send to the lab. Thankfully, two of my choices were really, really obvious because I had one fish showing severe signs of dropsy 
It was a broad tail mower. And they actually had another broad tail mower showing um, some slight scale lifting right behind the gill area. And in my experience, that's where the dropsy starts first, is on the scales that are right be behind the, uh, the gill covers. So those two choices were pretty obvious. And then there was a third fish that had a really strange, um, hard, large lump on one side of its abdomen only. And I thought that was really strange as well. So I decided to send that one as well. And they all three happened to be the broad tail moors. So once I selected which fish I was going to have to sacrifice, I packed them up and shipped them overnight to the University of Florida Diagnostic Lab. They received them without any issues, which I was so thankful about because she told me about another customer they had that sent fish on the same day that I sent fish and their fish got lost in shipping. So they had to select additional fish to send, which for a lot of their customers, for a lot of the clients that this lab works with is not a big deal because a lot of the clients that this lab works with are really large fish farms. So they have, thousands, tens of thousands, if not millions of fish to select from to send them. I only have like 25 fish to select from to send them. So if three of them get wasted, essentially, that would really suck. Thankfully, my fish made it to them safe and sound. These kinds of tests take a really, really long time to come back. And it was about three weeks ago now that I sent these fish out for testing. And I didn't want to tell you guys about what was going on until I had a definitive diagnosis to share with you as well because I mean, it's hard enough for me to talk about it, let alone for you guys to have to hear this and then to not have any answers. So I was trying to hold off until I got an answer, but it's still going to be another little while here until they can hopefully give me an answer on what it is that's going on. And I thought you guys deserved an update sooner than that. So I'm making today's video to let you guys know what's going on with my goldfish and uh, where we go from here. This is a lab that's held in very, very high esteem in the United States. So I feel really confident that they are gonna be the best chance for me to get a diagnosis. With that being said, they even told me that sometimes, no matter how hard they try, they cannot get a definitive diagnosis. With biology, with living organisms, Sometimes things just don't want to cooperate and you can't quite pinpoint the issue at hand even though you can clearly see that there is an issue. So they're going to do their best in getting me a diagnosis but they're, <laughs> I think they want me to be really guarded about whether they are going to be able to do that or not. So mostly what we're waiting on right now are a couple of bacterial cultures that actually take at least a month before you start seeing any results from them. So we have to wait on that until we know if it is those bacteria or not. But they have already done a set of more common bacterial cultures that don't take quite as long. They only take about a week before you start seeing growth on them. So those were uh, bacterial cultures for some of the, what they call run of the mill uh, bacterial infections that you'll run into with freshwater fish, especially with goldfish. And they found nothing. So it's not anything that's your run of the mill average bacteria that your normal hobbyist could combat with, you know, over the counter fish medications. So that's a relief in a way because it tells me that I'm not <laughs> just completely incompetent, which I, I didn't think that I was, but you know, after so long of battling the same issue over and over again, um, you start to feel a little bit that way. So I'm really glad that they were able to at least so far tell me that it's not a run of the mill bacterial uh, infection that I would have been able to treat on my own anyways. We're still waiting on those more advanced bacterial cultures and if it is one of those, those are going to be really really tough ones to treat and they're probably going to end up doing some antibiotic sensitivities to see if the particular bacteria that's affecting my fish is sensitive to any number of different antibiotics that they could prescribe to me to treat my fish with. The worst case scenario, on the other hand, would be that it comes back as being one of these types of bacteria. There are some types of bacteria that we don't have a known treatment for. So it might be one of those and they would have to tell me that there isn't a treatment for it and I would have to make the hard decision of what to do with my remaining fish that are carriers of this extremely uh, affected by and carriers of this extremely infectious and horrible disease that is a biosecurity risk on my property if I ever you know were to bring in 
more new fish, which I'm planning on doing. So that would be the worst case scenario and I'm, I'm trying to prepare myself for the worst, but also hoping that that's not what it's gonna be. There were also some abnormal findings on the kidneys of the fish that they did the histology on and it's, it, it points to certain things, but it is as yet inconclusive because just like with dropsy, there's a lot of other find abnormal findings that you can find on fish when you're examining them at this close of a level that do indicate a problem, but it could indicate any number of problems. So it's a process of elimination in figuring out exactly which problem it is. I wish I could tell you guys more, but they don't have a diagnosis for me yet. It's gonna be a little bit more of a wait. But I'll of course keep you guys updated as soon as I hear anything new from them. Um, I, I'm really hoping it's going to be treatable. I really, really am. So please keep your fingers crossed for me. For the moment, the remaining fish that I have all look okay except for my smallest Jikian, which again, she's also my favorite Jikian, which like I said, it always happens to your favorite ones. Um, she's the smallest one and she's the one that has the best form and the best color. She also has signs of dropsy and she's hanging in there so far. So maybe we'll get a diagnosis in time to be able to turn her around. So this really sucks to talk about and to have to uh, experience on such a public level. You know, most people who are fish keepers experience something like this at least once in their fish keeping journey where they lose a whole bunch of their fish, sometimes all of their fish, and have to start completely over. It's just that those people don't, <laughs> they're usually smart enough, I guess you could say, not to talk about it, whereas I'm the kind of person who's like honest to a fault and besides like even if I didn't talk about it you guys would know because you wouldn't see my fish anymore so I'm sharing my entire fish keeping journey the good the bad the ugly with you guys here on YouTube so you guys are seeing all of it whereas normally you would never hear about this unless you're like deep in the hobby because people don't like to talk about you know things that go wrong for them people only like to talk about things that go right for them unfortunately i've taken quite a bit of heat for this even though i don't deserve it <laughs> because this happens to everyone who has been keeping fish for as long as i've been keeping fish for eight years now and um, it happens, it, it does, it really does happen, which is part of the reason, again, why I'm talking about it, because I want you guys to know that like fish keeping is awesome, it's fun, it's great, it's super educational, it's entertaining, it's this, it's that, but there are bad things to it too, and if something goes wrong, don't give up. It's, it might be something you did wrong, it might not be. Just, you know, if it is something you did wrong, try to find out and do better for next time, but sometimes like, stuff just happens you know to the best of us so haters back off <laughs> i mean this is like hard enough for me to to go through without crappy people on the internet who remain anonymous um trying to like hurl insults at me or try to make it out like it's something i did wrong or it's my fault um Fish diseases happen out of the blue sometimes. Bacteria, parasites, and viruses can come in on frozen bloodworms that you feed your fish. It could have been brought in on the brine shrimp eggs that I was using to feed my baby goldfish. It could have been something as simple and stupid as that. And something like that can wipe out your entire stock without you ever having done anything wrong. It really is the good, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> and if you can pick yourself up out of that uh, bad and ugly and continue on it just makes you that much stronger for the most part um, all of you guys have been really really supportive throughout this my whole journey of fish keeping i've been doing youtube videos for the past like seven or eight years and all of some of you guys have been with me watching me from the very beginning which is amazing so i think you guys deserve this update and uh, i hope you appreciate finding out what's going on with my goldfish with that being said uh, I want to talk a little bit, hopefully switch gears, be a little bit more upbeat, <laughs> try to anyways, and talk about the fish room a little bit because there have been some little progress updates that I want to share with you guys. And uh, we do have a tropical storm on the way for this weekend, Hurricane Irma. Usually I try not to get too hysterical about tropical storms. I haven't been living in Florida long enough to be one of those people that's like, oh, hurricane schmurricane, you know? But I do think that 
you know, <laughs> a lot of the times the news media tends to blow these things way out of proportion and then it ends up being nothing. But it, it never hurts to be prepared and to be safe. I do have a generator that I used in the last bad storm that we had that was able to run my filters and even my refrigerator in the house. So I should be fine there. We have enough fuel for it for a little while anyways. Everything's probably going to be fine, but I am prepared guys, so you don't have to worry too much about me. About little old me, but I do want to show you guys just a quick little update on the uh, changes that have happened out here in the fish room in the past couple of weeks. I have managed to get all of the cabinets installed. Now these were like Ikea furniture. Basically they all came in big boxes and I had to assemble everything and then hang them up on the walls. It was it was quite the chore, <laughs> but I really love the result. This is so much storage space. You know you're truly a nerd about something when the thing that you get really excited about is having more storage space for the thing that you're nerdy about. The sink and faucet are being installed. This is just temporary board holding the sink in place until I get the counter installed. The counter is going to go from the edge of that all the way to that wall over there. There is my hose bib. So I'll have a place where I can hook up a hose to refill a tank here. And I can also be refilling a tank at the same time here. And both of them are temperature controlled. You can see the shower valve right there, that shiny obnoxious chrome thing. That will allow me to control the temperature of the water that comes out of that hose bib. This is another one of those things that I'm like nerdily excited about, because, but there's a good reason for it. So this is a motion activated hand soap pump and all, it's off right now, but all you have to do is like put your hand under here and it dispenses so you never have to touch it, which is actually seems kind of like frivolous, but it's actually really important for biosecurity with all the different fish tanks that I have. I always wash my hands and my arms all the way up to my armpits a lot of the time. You know, whatever part of my arm that touched the water of a tank, I always wash really well before moving on to the next tank. Because in addition to sharing equipment between tanks, which could be a vector for introducing new disease into a tank that didn't already have it, your arms and your hands can also do the same thing. So you have to wash really well be between tanks in addition to using separate equipment. But if you are like coming up to the soap pump and like pressing on it with your hand to get the soap out, you are uh, contaminating the soap pump. So <laughs> I saw this when I was going to pick up the fridge for the fish room and I just knew I had to have it because I can use it without ever contaminating it and worrying about that as a potential source of cross-contamination. Here's the fridge. It's currently plugged in but there's nothing in it because I'm actually going to unplug it pretty soon here since we might lose power anyways because of the hurricane that's coming. So I'll just unplug that and, and start filling it up once the storm passes. But I've started filling up some of my fish stuff in here, just some of it. Everything is probably going to be rearranged several times before I'm finally happy with where things are at. This is so far the storage cabinet for my uh, reptiles and amphibians. Up top here is the spot for all the stuff that I have for my dart frogs. Uh, these are my fruit fly cultures. The individual cultures are in these deli cups and they are resting in plastic shoe boxes that have about a half an inch of diatomaceous earth inside of them. It's actually made out of finely ground fossilized protists and it kills bugs. So in order for the grain mites to get into the fruit fly cultures, they would have to walk across quite a bit of the diatomaceous earth and they just wouldn't be able to do that. So. This is a good way to keep your cultures grain mite free. The reason grain mites are such a problem is they're really attracted to this stuff at the bottom of the culture. That is stuff for the fruit flies to eat and the grain mites love it too. Problem is the grain mites can outcompete the fruit flies. So if they get in there and infest your fruit fly cultures, your fruit flies are gonna be diminished to the point where they're not even reproducing anymore and you're, you're gonna lose your culture of fruit flies to the grain mites. And the fruit flies, of course, are what you have to feed to the poison dart frogs because they're actually evolved to eat really small insects. So usually crickets are way too big for them to eat and fruit flies are the perfect size. Down here, I have some things for my leopard geckos. Go on and on with cupboards, but the top ones are all empty for now. There's going to be a desk under these ones. You can see it taped off on the floor there. That's where the desk is gonna go. And then next to that is going to be 
a unit that has three stacked terrariums. Of course, one of them is gonna be for my poison dart frogs, another one for my leopard geckos, and then the third one is probably gonna be for a giant day gecko. And this looks kind of goofy because this is where I originally wanted the water heater, but I originally was expecting I would need a much, much larger water heater. So it was gonna be really tall and it was gonna interfere with the view from the window. So I told my contractor that I wanted it placed about here. So that's where he roughed in all the pipes and the electrical for it. And then after that was all done, <laughs> I realized that I would actually not need that big of a water heater and I could get away with a much, much smaller one. So I have a smaller one. It's lower than the windowsill, so it can be up against that corner there, which is actually the ideal spot for it anyways. So he had to move the pipes over there, but I don't think it's gonna be that big of a deal because I'm gonna paint them the same color as the wall and most of those pipes are gonna be covered up by a huge tall uh, terrarium rack anyways. My air conditioning unit is finally installed and it is glorious. It's amazing to walk into here from the sauna that is the outside of central Florida <laughs> and be able to walk in here and be perfectly comfortable. Uh, it takes a lot of the moisture out of the air, but not enough, so I also have this dehumidifier that runs all the time. I have them both turned off right now for the video. I've started uh, also installing my security system out here. Yes, I will have a security system out here, just like I do on my house, in case somebody gets the wise idea that they're gonna break in. Just so you know, that would be a very, very bad idea. I have taped off here where the big 2300 gallon tank is gonna go. I always knew it was gonna be big and I knew roughly where it was gonna go, but to see it taped off like that, Wow, that thing is ginormous. It's gonna be all glass. It's gonna be raised off the floor by a couple of feet, probably by a welded metal frame. And then it's gonna be, I think, like four feet tall, um, five and a half feet wide, and 15 feet long. And the back couple of feet here in between the tank and the wall, so like this area here, is gonna be reserved for all the filtration that it's gonna need. And then along this wall here, you guys have already been over all this, but there's going to be, in the corner by the windows, there's going to be two stacked 110 gallon po blue poly tanks, plastic tanks, for raising goldfish in when and if I ever start breeding my goldfish again. Then I'm going to have two identical units that are each going to have two stacked 100 gallon aquariums on them. So that's 600 total gallons of space dedicated just to goldfish. Third unit is going to be a 100 gallon tank on the bottom with an amphibious tank on the top. The cool thing about these amphibious tanks and why I really wanted to do one is because they're so unique. Uh, the bottom part of it holds water, and then on top of that they have a sliding panel door, and then it's just open air above the water. And I'm going to put my axolotls in that tank. Now they could do just fine in an aquarium, but I have never seen before where someone sets up a really beautifully um, scaped riparium for axolotls. So I really wanted to do that. The last one next to that will be two stacked 120 to 130 gallon aquariums. One of them I think I'm going to set up as a saltwater aquarium, which is really exciting. That'll be my first saltwater aquarium. That you guys will be able to go on that journey with me and learn a lot about it along with me. And then the other one I want to do a freshwater community aquarium. And I don't know exactly what kind of fish I want yet. I think I want angelfish, because I love angelfish, and also some kind of pleco, because right now my albino longfin bristlenose plecos are some of the favorite fish of mine that I have ever had. Now that they've grown a little bit, I can start to tell the difference between the two of them. One is clearly a female and one is clearly a male. You can tell that he has like little whiskers starting to grow on his nose already. It's the cutest thing ever and they're just so fun to watch. So I definitely wanna get some more different kinds of plecos for the fish room once everything is all set up and running. I've always liked the zebra pleco, so that might be an option. Also, all of the uh, exterior lights are set up, and I decided to put the exterior lights on a timer. So that's what this one is for. It has a little flip down panel where you can adjust when and for how long they stay on. This one is, again, a light switch timer for the lights that are going to be set up in 
the uh, center of the ceiling there hanging over the 2300 gallon aquarium. Things are slowing down a little bit now because there's not a whole lot more that I can do until the tanks start getting in here, which will be not for another eight to 10 weeks is what I'm being told. So it's a little bit of a wait, but I am planning on setting up a couple, actually probably four 40 gallon breeder tanks in here to start fishless cycling them so that once the tanks arrive, I will have cycled filter media to add to the tanks so it won't be an additional wait before we can add fish to them. So once the tanks arrive, we should be able to add fish immediately and start getting this up and running. And then all the tanks are not gonna be arriving all at once, they're gonna be arriving bit by bit. So that'll also give me time to like set everything up nice and slowly because I don't wanna be overwhelmed with all of these tanks all at once. That would be way too insane. That's about it for today's video, guys. Um, sorry about the bad news, but I thought you deserved to know what was going on with my goldfish. Keep your fingers crossed for me, send good vibes, whatever it is that you do, that everything will turn out okay for my goldfish and I'll be able to treat and save the remaining ones. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching today's video and until next time, stay gold.